Hi everyone, and welcome to episode number six of Immigrants Life podcast, where we share stories of people who left their own country to chase a better life. Um, this episode is a little bit different. Uh, my guest today, Craig, has just moved to the UK from New Zealand. His partner and two children have a UK passport, so they thought it wouldn't be too difficult for him to get a visa. Um, unfortunately, they rejected his application. Now he has to leave his family and go back to New Zealand to reapply. He will share his experience with the immigration process, frustration and steps he has now to take to reunite with his family. So please enjoy this episode with Craig. Hey, Craig. Uh, thanks for being here today. How are you doing? Good, good. Thank you, Daniel. Yeah, good. Good to be here. Um, Craig, so do you want to introduce a little bit yourself? What do you do, where you're from and uh, where you are right now? Yeah, sure. Well, yeah, my name's uh, Craig Cherson, a um, uh, New Zealander, New Zealander um, agricultural worker, farm manager, uh, currently unemployed and, and stuck in the UK. So, yeah, where I am at the moment. <laughs> what do you mean by stuck in the UK? Well, as supposed to, I'm heading back to New Zealand in a couple of weeks um, to reapply again. So, yeah, leave the kids and and, and go through the uh, the process again after the, the first attempt um, of, of applying for my UK spousal visa failing. Okay, okay. Let's let's go back a little bit. So you're from from New Zealand, right? Yeah. How long have you been in the UK for? Um, six months. Okay, six months was uh, before the all the COVID started, right? Yeah, yeah. Um, so I came over, so we applied and naively, I, I guess, um, thought we'd be pretty much right. My partner's English, my two boys, uh, English citizens, English passports and stuff, and thought it was, you know, we've owned a business together and nothing to hide and been together for, you know, over 10 years with my partner and I and thought we ticked all the boxes and that, so we sold a place and gave up our jobs and went after I applied for um, the spousal visa and thought it was pretty a foregone conclusion and that. So when that all failed, it was like when I got rejected for that, it was like, well, you know, what are we going to do? Just keep, we decided to keep moving in that direction to keep some stability in that for the kids for what the eventual goal was. So my plan was to um, come over for Christmas with them and get the kids settled and stuff and into school and stay for sort of my three month visit a visa and get them settled um, and wait around because you have to wait. We have to wait six months, you know, that whole six month thing to reapply. So generally kill that time. And then, um, yeah, I was supposed to head back in March and start the reapplying thing. And then COVID happened and stuff. So I've been stuck here, been babysitting and not, yeah, just waiting to see how things go or the visa centers and that are closed or not processing visas and trouble getting home and being with the kids and yeah just doing that so yeah it's drawn it out even a little bit longer so yeah coming up six months i've been away now <laughs> unemployed and uh waiting to yeah try and do it again and go forward um so you are just at the beginning of your journey as an immigrant um do you mind telling me the reason why they rejected uh, your visa application um, financial grounds. So yeah, we miss mm, the way it was set out and not very clearly in that the financial requirement, we misread the table and stuff because Anna was not living and working over here. Um, she was coming over with me and not having, um, a job and stuff, the amount of money, we thought it was like 22 and a half thousand pounds or whatever the figure was that the table showed that we would need to have saved. But because neither of us had jobs and the two dependents and that, it was something like 65,000. So we were short with our savings quite a bit and um, on what we needed. So, yeah, we passed in every other regard on the rejection letter, you know, obviously being together and having kids and proving our history and our all that stuff. But yeah, they, they rejected it. There was no appeal, rejected it on financial grounds. Oh, wow. I thought being in a relationship would be enough to get a relationship visa, but it's... Uh, I know. Not I, had a, I had a job offer. We proved we had a roof over our head. We're still here at the in-laws and that to, for us when we started and this and that. And where where anyone with half a brain and can't get a job, you know, where you need 
65,000 pounds um, to survive. Or I don't know where they come up with that figure, but yeah, that was yeah. a lot more than we had saved. So, yeah. yeah. I mean, yeah, it's, it's, it's a lot of, it's a lot of money. And then I don't, it's, um, as, as, I don't know if you know, but as far as you know, uh, it's um, the price or the amount of money, it's equal all over uh, the UK or just depend on where you live. So if you live in no, London, that's, it's more expensive and it's, uh, you need more. No, no, it's across the board. That's their stance on the website. It's not geographical. It's the breakdown of, yeah, of of what you need because Anna wasn't working and stuff um, to somehow, yeah, they come up with that figure to support yourself and not be a burden on the uh, economy till you can get a job or get on your feet and stuff apparently. So, yeah. You said already a, a job offer. Did it make any difference having a job offer or no? Yeah, I had a job offer and they know nothing to totally separate things applying through your partner and that doesn't matter. It's not a sponsorship thing. It doesn't, didn't come into it. They, they, they didn't care. So, yeah, you couldn't reason. You don't, didn't get a caseworker. You know, it's black and white. Someone sitting in an office ticking the box, yes or no. You, I never got the contact from New Zealand trying to talk to anyone or get a caseworker where you could, you know, reason with them and show them what you've got and that you're not, you know, not going to be a problem and reason with anyone. There's just not that opportunity. It's send all that paperwork off black and white and that's what you submitted at the time and, yeah, yeah, I yeah I know. It seems like uh, you're just a number. Doesn't matter if that number means a lot. I mean, it's, for us, is our life. They that's what they're playing yeah. with. They're just our life. I got the same situation in New Zealand. They got they were, the, they denied my application for permanent residency in New Zealand. Um, yeah. At the time, because with the company I was working for, I was trying to explain the the, the immigration uh, advisor, the immigration officer, the, my situation and. Because at the time it was even actually overseas, it was in actually in Italy for my brother's wedding. But even then, yeah. they closed the case before I was. I had the chance to ex- actually explain myself or figure out how to solve the problem. It was, first, it was a lot yeah. of money to, to do the application. Second, it was it ch- changed completely your life. You time and yeah. being like a resident and you're able to find another job or being able to stay for a, a longer time to yeah. be on a visa again and you have to reapply for a visa and did don't renew your visa you kick out of the country it's yeah so many things involved they it seems like they i guess it's just their job and uh they do what they yeah can, but, at the same but, time but i agree like you say i think it just it does it made it feel like just number and just a money-making venture like fail as many as you can and three and a half grand and apply again you know <laughs> wasted yeah. like and time and you know plans and setting the kids up to go and that emotional you know, roller coaster, and then just yeah, black and white, no, no reasoning, just pay your money and try again, sort of thing. It's how it's is how it's felt. Yeah, yeah. So, so. I mean, in my case, I even feel like I rejected the country where I was trying to build my life on. Seems like they didn't want me. So yeah, yeah. Well, you've been there, living and working, and set yourself up, and yeah, and they just go no. Yeah, it's, it's yeah, it's um, really hard. I don't get it. Just like uh, things like it's all bureaucracy, which doesn't make, I think that doesn't make any sense. Even when I came here in Canada, the whole process yeah. of getting a visa, just let me work. So if I work, you can make money. If I make yeah. money, I can pay taxes. It just, it's no brainer, but for, it was just a, such a long process. F- figuring out and f- finding the information was nearly impossible. Do you have, it seems like you have to pay somebody to actually get yeah. the information. Mm. Like, I uh, didn't have the same experience in New Zealand. Actually, New Zealand, the website, I'd done everything myself. I could find all the information, all the paperwork, the forms. I've yeah. done all myself. Here in <clears> Canada, <throat> I couldn't do it. You couldn't find a form. You couldn't find a way to do it. Each province is different. Um, right. So it's, you literally have to pay an expert. You have to pay a, a lawyer to yeah to, give it, to, to get the case done. Wow. Is yeah, same, that's tough. Is it the same there? Yeah, I think, yeah, the very, very much the UK one is, um, yeah, I mean, I'm not, don't claim to be an expert at forms and paperwork and stuff like that, but made it very, very confusing and seems like that. I've talked to a couple of immigration lawyers and that since I've been here, but 
yeah, over there, the same thing. You, you couldn't get any help trying to get answers on it. And when you were confused and that, any, no one in New Zealand knows about it. The only immigration lawyers in New Zealand are dealing with people, yeah, um, coming over to New Zealand and that side of it. As soon as called around, called around so many and um, trying to get an answer and they're like, no, you'd have to talk to someone in London or the UK. We don't, obviously, yeah, they just don't know anything about if you're a Kiwi stuck in New Zealand trying to get over here, then they know nothing about that system. You have to try and get on the phone or email or talk to someone in the UK from New Zealand and do it that way. So, yeah, it made it really hard. And like I said, we didn't. We thought, you know, we made sense of it and we thought it was pretty straightforward and had no issues or anything to hide and with my partner and the kids all being British and, and yeah, wanting to move back and, yeah, me going along, I thought it, we thought it would be pretty straightforward um, the way it read. But, yeah, like I said, they they found a reason not to. So, <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah, that's that's really sucks. I'm sorry for that. Um, so what's the, what's the next step from? Yeah, well, I'm, you have to, you know, apply from out of the country and that, and it's really eating away at me and that, having to go back. But, yeah, be away from my boys and that for three or four months. But... We've got to keep going forward now. We only failed on one ground in theory, the financial, everything else. We well and truly, you know, proved and got nothing to hide our, our relationship status and all that stuff. Um, so going to go back and arrive in the country, do my quarantine, walk out, hand the papers in again, pay the money. And um, we've got the funds now. We've had the funds in our account for six months because you've got to show the six months consecutive bank statements from the difference. Um, and Anna, my partner, will have been now, I guess, the upside with the COVID and that um, will have been in her job here for six okay. months. So that's six months, so double double the things you need on that side. You either needed a partner working or that amount of money. We've got both. So, yeah, go back and do the process again and, hopefully get back to the kids before Christmas. I, I, so you have to go back to New Zealand and you can't come back until you get a visa. You can't even come back like a, a tourist visa? No, I've done my six months. You're only allowed six months in one year. I've oh. well had that. So I wouldn't be able to come back till mid-December. We arrived in mid-December last year. Um, so, yeah, I've done my six months. So, yeah. I won't be, either they'll be coming back to me or I'll get the visa. No, I won't be able to come back till I get that in my hand. And they take your passport off you anyway. So. Oh, wow. So hopefully yeah. you, the process will be pretty short. Yeah, well, no, it's not. It's They say 12 weeks anyway, three okay. months. They say everything's, it won't be any shorter at the moment since they've been closed for a couple of months with COVID and the backlog and whatever so at this stage i can't even get an answer they're saying christchurch wellington is closed i'd have to go to auckland and whether it's open the visa processing to do your biometrics again and to hand it in and that i still can't even about to fly out in 10 days and can't get an answer if they're open but new zealand's pretty much back to normal so they should be reopening but yeah, it's if it was just me, it's all right. But family and being away from them, my boys and that for that long is, um, yeah, it's it's hard. It's going to be a hard, yeah, hard absolutely. Waiting, checking the litter box every day when it gets to that time. So, mm. yeah, I thought you can just leave the country and come back and just restart your six months or your three months visa, whatever it is. Mm. I thought there was uh, couldn't done that, but no, 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 the UK don't let you know. You have to apply from out of the country and you have to be, yeah, I have to go back to New Zealand, applying through there and then they have to send your passport away with it. So that was it. That's a, uh, yeah, hard thing. Lose that for three months too. Uh, yeah. I know a friend who managed to overstay in the UK for a few years until he got caught. Yeah. He had a list of tricks to sneak into the country. Um, I'm not saying that to suggest the listener to get into the country legally. Please don't. But was to underline that the immigration process can be very overwhelming, so much so that people do desperate things to try to stay in the country. Uh, I nearly got put on a plane when I got here at Christmas because they had 
it came up when I was coming in and I naively thought, you know, the two things were totally separate and applied for an immigration visa and stuff because that was rejected. They thought I was trying to sneak in and I was interrogated and sat in that room for about five hours and apparently it was that close and a pleading with them through customs and going to check our stories and that, that close to putting me on a plane and not even letting me in the country on my visitor visa. Oh, wow. Visa was sorted out. So, yeah, that was, that was, um, bad enough so i think overstaying or risking that another reason for them to look back when they check you out and that to fail but yeah as i understand it they said they'll know and you're only allowed six months in any one in, in a year so <clears throat> yeah can't come back and yeah i have to apply through the um through the consulate in new zealand so i couldn't just duck across to france or whatever and send the paperwork off so yeah no, they don't let you do any of that here. <clears throat> okay, so probably the next advice it probably won't be helpful, but I'll give you anyway because that if if I knew that at the time it was it would actually save me a few months. Um, but so my visa when I go here expire in October, so I have to stop working in October. And yeah. when I finally figure out the way to get my work permit because I have everything lined up, I have the job and everything. So when I managed to get uh, speak to an officer, he would ask me. Are you, Daniel, do you, are you working right now? Like, no, of course I'm not working. My visa expired in October. And I said, yeah. if you're applying to renew your visa, it will re be rejected. But until they rejected it, they can't, you can stay in the country until you got the answer, even if it's negative, but you can stay in the country until you get uh, your answer back. So yeah. you can actually work. So you can actually ask for a renew your visa. You can actually still working until they rejected it. Yeah. I don't know if you can, can you, do something similar they apply I think, for i think it would be the same here because they say all their their statement i can't get it exactly but there'll be no no change of status on your visa till a decision is made so yeah if you get that paperwork in the same thing till you're rejected or whatever you can probably keep working but for me it's vice versa because i'm only on a visitor visa so i can't work until <laughs> i get that status change and that's hence why I need to go back to and do a bit of work on a couple of mates farms and earn a bit of money I've been sitting here risk not being allowed to work and do anything for six months now is uh yeah chewing the money away and relying on Anna and uh yeah so while I'm waiting for that I'll go back and earn a few dollars and feel like I can do something it gets a bit frustrating as I'm yeah, sure know. you know I've been around and not being allowed to work and not feeling like a part of a society at all so yeah yeah and uh, you've been like in the you feel like you're in this kind of limbo where you don't know what's gonna happen and that's, yeah. that's the most frustrating part mm -hmm. at least for me when when i was doing it was just let me it know is. I, I just want an answer just tell me if i can stay or not if you don't know you have yeah. to pack your bag anytime soon and just leave or you can stay it's just so yeah. frustrating it is it is. It's the unknown that kills you, isn't it? You go through phases of, yeah, it's going to work out and that, and start going on and looking for jobs that appeal and you might apply for and, and that. And then you go, oh, what's the point? And you get frustrated because you don't know what's going to happen. And I went through that last time. I was sure it would happen. And with my farm experience and that, I mucked these people around, you know, um, yeah, had the job offer to run this farm and said my visa should be through by this date and the 12 weeks that they said it would take to process and I should be able to be there by, you know, September last year and then, yeah, failed and wasted their time and my time and everything. Yeah. So, like, yeah. If you only knew that that was the requirement. Yeah. I mean, could it be done by now? I yeah. Why exactly. they're making it so hard. And then, you know, it should be a simple process of ticking the boxes early and get back to you a couple of weeks or whatever and they wait the full three three and a half months you know when they knew it was probably sitting on a pile and knew it was going to be rejected where well, you could have had a couple of months under your belt of that money in the bank or been doing that but you waste all that time and um yeah they send it back to you still after that full time period and go you're rejected and yeah yeah it could have been well underway but yeah we've lost we've lost a good a good year really COVID yeah. as well, of, um, yeah, of where we wanted to be and setting our life up here with, with my partner and the boys and that and going forward, it's like, yeah, we're still in limbo. So, Yeah. Yeah, I remember yeah. when I was trying to figure out the, inf the information, I even tried to call the um, Immigration Canada over the phone 
which wasn't easy to get through the phone. You have to, have to wake up like at four o'clock in the morning because that was eight o'clock on the other side of Canada. And that was the yeah. only time I could actually talk to somebody. But even then, I, I called, I probably managed to speak with somebody three times. And the first mm. two times were one who was actually making, making fun of me. Uh, really? Yeah. I sent all the paperwork um, like a, by mail because um, they said that I, couldn't, I couldn't do it over the internet. In my case, I couldn't do it over the internet, so I have to send all the paperwork. And they've been, so I received, they received the paperwork or somebody received the paperwork or all my documents, but it was being signed off by FedEx. The name of the person was like a FedEx. So I called them up, I was like, I wanna make sure you guys got the documents and mm. I wanna make sure they actually went to the, to the right office. And they said, oh, we, Daniel, we don't do that. We just give you a call. We send you a, a, a notification when we start processing your uh, your application. Like, yeah, and like uh, and she was laughing. I was like, oh, that's gonna take another six months. Like we're processing now. I think it was in that was in December. Like, oh, we're processing now the the document we, we receive in August. So it's gonna be another six months. Like, so you want me to stay here for waiting for another six months? I don't even know if you guys got it. If it's yeah. been in the right pile, maybe it's been like in the wrong pile. It's going to wait here for another six months where I'm not able to work. And exactly. she was like, it was, like, it was kind of laughing at me. I yeah. managed to uh, call her another, once again or maybe twice again. And finally, I found this person like, Daniel, you can't apply for this kind of permit within Canada. You need to leave Canada. Either you go back to Italy, back to New Zealand or go to the US, but you can't apply within Canada. Yeah. So... At least now, she spent the time to figure out my situation, which the other two didn't. And she, she gave me kind, kind of the situation, kind of the how to do it, that I, I couldn't actually, that what I've done so far was actually not, was actually wrong. So she yeah. gave me the information to move forward. But at the same time, I had to pay somebody to tell me exactly what to do. And the whole freaking thing, it took me two, half an hour. I had to walk, I had to drive to the border. And on the way back, they gave me the visa. Why <laughs> nobody told me that? I had to pay yeah. somebody to tell me, Daniel, you have to go outside. You have to go back to the U. You have to go to the U.S. Come back on the way back. They should they should be able to give you the visa. You have all the paperwork. Yeah. Uh, nobody, nobody from the immigration told me that I had to pay somebody to do it. That's it. They do. They seem to make it that hard. And you're right. Like in this modern day today, you should be able to get email or MS notifications of where it's at and the process along. But I, I, we're the same, like the waiting around and that. You put together a time. We had a two inch p- thick pile of, you know, copies of our mortgages and photos and things of kids and to prove all that documentation. You whack it in the courier bag, goes to Auckland, it's processed and gets sent to the UK. And you know nothing for three, three and a half months. You're just sitting there, like I say, checking the letterbox, wondering, trying to sort your life out, make some sort of plan. You get no notifications till that horrible, unfortunately, rejection came in the mail. <laughs> so after your life out, you don't know, yeah, if it's lost sitting behind someone's desk, if they're looking at it, if it's not, if, yeah, anywhere along the process, how it's going. And that is really, really frustrating. Mm. Yeah, yeah, no, it is. <clears throat> Okay, let's move um, to something more like a maybe more uh, positive. Like, do you want to tell me how you guys met or what's the, the story? Uh, so why, so from New Zealand, you said that you met in the US, right? And then yeah. you lived in New, in, in New Zealand for a while and, and now you decide to move to, to the UK. Can you walk, walk me through where you guys met and why did you make the decision to move to the UK? Yeah, well, we met um, skiing. I was a ski instructor for a long time between... Um, New Zealand and States and Canada and stuff. Um, so, yeah, we met uh, teaching in Utah. Um, and, yeah, I was been doing it for a long time and not so long and didn't want to um, keep doing it. So we got together and came back here to the UK for a while and did my working holiday and had a look around here and um, then went and ran a chalet in France for a year, um, ski season, some guiding and doing that sort of thing. And um, Anna, like New Zealand, she had been over there doing some instructor training a couple of years ago. And I said I was keen to go back for settle down and stop living out of a pack for a while. Um, and then, yeah, one thing, I had some land over there, um, some farmland and stuff. And uh, she liked horses. And, yeah, we sort of went back to New Zealand and um, 
settle to a simpler life and did the farming thing and a rural um, lifestyle for a while. And, um, yeah, then the kids came along and um, that's when you get, you know, the need for family and not having a babysitter or anyone because, yeah, my immediate family and most of my family is in Oz. I moved to Oz when I was 10. So, um, yeah, they're all over there and stuff. So we didn't have any family network around us really after enjoying New Zealand and that, but yeah, just that pull of family and having grandparents and things to help out with the kids and that network. Um, we decided that, yeah, we will give before the kids are too old or into too far into school. One's five, one's three. At the moment we'd um, come back, be around her family and give the, give the UK a go and make a decision, which, which is the bigger pull for us, family or lifestyle. Right now, where's the, where's the gauge towards the, the lifestyle or towards the family? It's really hard at the moment to be totally honest. You know, we're not really living the life. We're at the in-laws being in lockdown. I don't have a job. The kids are happy around their cousins and staff and settled in. My one that's at school was settled in, which was from a small, small, you know, rural school, as you know, in New Zealand mm -hmm. country school to a school in London was real worry for me and that, but he's settled in and enjoying that. So yeah, the, the, the kids are happy. Um, and that sort of thing. So yeah, still, still keen to give it a good go and make it work. If, um, yeah, this will be the last chance though. That's for sure. Second attempt only. And then it'll be, uh, yeah, <laughs> it's taken a lot out of me probably, but as long as the kids are fine and, and it's all right, it's, um, we'll plow on for the family. So, yeah. Yeah, yeah. No, I mean, it's a big, it's, I think it's a big step from <clears throat> New Zealand. Like you were in a, in a small town outside of Christchurch, right? Towards uh, Mount Hutt. Yeah, on the way to the West Coast. Yeah, yeah, Darfield, about 40 minutes out of Christchurch, heading west towards Arthur's Pass. Yeah. So like from a small town in New Zealand, which is already not very populated country to, the, <laughs> to London, it must be like a big step. Yeah, yeah, definitely. I mean, the goal, we will still go um, rural if all works out and stuff with my, my backgrounds, agriculture, farming and that sort of thing. So we'll go to a smaller, definitely not a professional and don't have the money to uh, survive or get our foot in the door in London um, and that. And we're, we're lucky we're in a lovely area here, but it might be where we stay. I might get my visa, we'll be yeah, going more rural again, but yeah. It is. It is a big change. That's for yeah, sure. Yeah, especially skiing wise. There's not much skiing happening in in the UK. No, is it? no, no. That's for sure. Europe's yeah. Europe's accessible though, which is good. And get the kids out there. Boy started. My youngest started at three and a half, and been yeah, a couple of season passes under his belt at Mount Hutt oh, and sweet. stuff. He's keen to get on the big mountains. Told him all about staying on snow and <laughs> you know having ski holidays in Europe. So he's He's pretty keen for that. <clears throat> yeah, definitely ski fields in Europe are different from New Zealand yeah. from Mount Hutt. <laughs> That's for sure. Yeah. Yeah. Do I think? yeah, so further on, I don't know. Like you say, Daniel, I, we're only, we're still in limbo. We haven't got there and those questions that you sent got there and what we think of it and life. We're hoping that it's going to be good with family around us and get jobs and get ahead and, and stuff over here. But it's all, yeah, up in the air a bit at the moment. We're still going through the application process or going to start it again, I guess. So <clears throat> Yeah. All. And hopefully then we'll be all good if they don't change the rules once again, because I can yeah. keep changing the. That's it. And that's my fear too, a bit. I want to get this process in and done with, in a way, Brexit, you know, is going to be good and hopefully open, especially agriculturally. A lot of the uh, overseas workers and that and open up more jobs and that for me, but with everything that's happened with COVID and this and that is, back of your mind it's like are they just gonna not let anyone else in and just keep things shut the borders and a lot of people lost their jobs and and you know quite a bit of unemployment and stuff are they going to be even tougher on the visa processing you know going forward in the next while or what but yeah that's again an unknown but i'll definitely um throughout and i'll definitely keep you posted anyway i can keep you posted on <laughs> how this round goes or if it's any different or <laughs> yeah i'd be happy to have you for the yeah, interview part two 
yeah, hopefully it's all approved and moving forward and settling into life as an immigrant. <laughs> yeah, hopefully next time we'll be a permanent resident in Canada because still waiting for that. I applied last January, so over a okay. year ago. Wow, I'm still waiting. How I'm long does that take? Is it five years? Do you have to be there? Is it five years? How long? No, you- actually, I I had to apply for the permanent residency when I applied for the work permit. Oh, okay. Wanna, yeah, they want to make sure that. Um, I was actually planning to stay. It was not just coming here for work a little bit. They wanted to, because I apply through like a skilled, um, skilled visa or something like that. Yeah. So they, because they needed people like me, that's why I got the visa. Otherwise, I couldn't get it. Yeah. And they want to make sure I wanted to stay. I want to stay. They sponsor me and everything, but they want to make sure I want to stay. So I, I had to apply for a permanent residency. I wasn't going mm-hmm. to. Yeah. Um, especially because at the beginning, it was like, as I said, you feel like rejected, like. Why the hell I'm gonna tell you I'm gonna stay here, pay more money to ask for a permanent residency? Where so far I only have rejection from from you guys. The whole experience since I got into the country wasn't good. Yeah. Why should I stay longer? Yeah. It's just, it's just in my head, like if I didn't have to, which, no way I wouldn't done it. I was like, there's yeah. no way. After this experience, how do you guys treated me? No. I'm not no. Doing it. Well, I was Nelly going to try and do my Canada one of me many years ago through a company I was working for up there and stuff. And um, yeah, it's just so, it looked like it at the time, like they were going to help in that with sponsorship and that, but it just seems so hit and miss and yeah, hard to figure out the point system on what was wanted this week, you know, at the moment, yeah, you're gold or it could be. And next week it's like, no, you get no points, not interested in you. You just, yeah, don't bother. So yeah. Yeah, and the thing is, they kind of like upset me on the process to apply. So I had a job offer. Uh, so actually, my boss sponsored me for for the visa. So I had the job offer, and to get a visa, even though I had the job and that job offer, I had to take an English test, the IELTS, um, wow. which everybody has to, has to do. Even if you come from England, everybody needs to has to take this test. So just wow. to prove my English level is fine, my English level is not. Which, if I got a job offer, my bosses are willing to sponsor me to go through the process to take me. That means my English is already good enough for them. But I still, yeah. have, to, I still have to prove that, which I'm not contrary to that. I think if you if you decide to live in a country, especially if you become permanent residency, I think you, you have to speak the language properly. Yeah, I I'm, I'm totally okay with that. But the problem was when I applied for permanent residency, they, they, that wasn't, wasn't a requirement. And also they would ask me what kind of language I was speaking and if I need an interpreter. <laughs> so I need to prove you I can speak a good English if I want to yeah. work if, if I want to work in Canada but to live permanently in Canada you yeah. ask me if I need an interpreter <laughs> that doesn't make any freaking sense to me yeah different yeah the, yeah. each one seems different and what they're wanting and yeah the goalposts always seem to change and yeah very confusing yeah it was very as I said it was very the whole process were very frustrating yeah. I think everybody that I don't think there's anybody that been through immigration and had a good experience. Uh, just no, no, it does. It definitely feels like you're, um, yeah, they're looking for a reason, or you're not wanted initially. I guess, yeah, well, they're looking for a reason not to have you. But yeah, like I say, at least it's across the board. It's not just you, is it? It's, I suppose that's the one thing you get out of it: talking to different people and listening to these things and that. that You've got to be determined, I suppose, and plow on. It's the, it's the same for everyone. <laughs> yeah, and in, in most cases, it's totally worth it because at least for me, my experience when I went to New Zealand and that to the process, even though the process, actually the process in New Zealand wasn't too bad to get a work permit. It was pretty straightforward and yeah. it took me, took me a couple of weeks to get it. Probably even because of the, the earthquake. So Christchurch at the time was rebuilding everything. So they really needed people at the time. So it was yeah. just the process. I was just lucky at the time. Um, yeah. But even though going through the whole process, but at the end it was totally worth it. Just yeah, it's totally worth it. Hopefully, it will be totally worth it for you too. And hopefully, you'll yeah. love UK. You just yeah, hopefully, hopefully it'll work out. And yeah, happy, happy times for the family. <laughs> yeah, sweet. I wish you all the all the best and good luck on uh, for the next few months until you're waiting for the for your for your yeah. visa. Yeah, I suppose that's always the hardest thing, isn't it? The waiting and that. So, yeah, we'll get there. All right. Cool, Daniel. Thank you very much. It was good to meet you and thanks for your time. Hope it helped oh, you. 
new yeah. some bits of it. So. No, absolutely. It was, it was great to meeting you and talking to you. And thank you for taking the time to actually take the interview. No worries. No worries, mate. Thanks awesome. a lot. Okay. All right. Talk thank to you, you later. Okay. See ya. Bye. I hope you enjoyed this episode. I'm sure many of you had a similar experience going through your visa application, or maybe you're dealing with it right now. It's not an easy process most of the time, but from my experience, it's totally worth it. So if you're in the process of getting your visa or it's been rejected, don't give up. My heart goes to Craig and his family and all the people in a similar situation. If you are an immigration advisor or an immigration officer, uh, please get in touch with me. I'd like to hear the other side, the immigration side. I like to understand why the things are in the way they are, and maybe if we have a better picture of the whole process, we would be more compassionate and less frustrated. Thanks for tuning in this week, and as usual, if you want to be on the show, send me an email at stories at immigrantslife.com or visit the website immigrantslife.com. If you like the show, please give us a review. It will help the show growing and reach more people. Thanks again, and talk to you in the next one. Ciao.